You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. There was a point in time in the course of my incarceration when I was extremely violent. Um, I've been involved in many knife fights. I've been shot many times. He said, young Mike, he says, you're either with us or you're against us. And I said, well, then I'm against you. And he said, well, all right, young Mike, then you you go ahead and you go on in and you make yourself a knife and I'll meet you out here in the morning. And that was my introduction to the three inch cockroaches at Old Folsom. You know, I was in a strip cell and it only had a hole in the floor. That's all I had. And the cockroaches would come up through that hole in the floor and they would come up my body and I couldn't lift my arms. Um, so they would come up and eat the food off my face. And um, being confronted with that, I just simply named them. I have no appreciation whatsoever for violence. But um, the fact of the matter is I'm very good at it. I was shot five times once with a shotgun. And that was, um, the gunner was only eight feet off the floor. He was up in a tower just above the fence. And so all he did was lean over the tower and what I refer to as point blank range. So I took five rounds in the back. And um, uh, the doctor told me if I didn't have the mass on me of muscle, that it would have penetrated my heart and my lungs. But I took the knife away from him. And when I put him down, he begged for his life. So I tattooed, I choked up on the knife and I tattooed a series of wounds around his heart to remind him that I had given him his life. That's a process. And then of course I was engaged in combat with the enemy. At this time it was the Black Panthers and Black Guerrilla family and, and, and the Western Familia and the Texas Syndicate. And an ally was the Mexican Mafia and uh, the Hells Angels. And of course I've observed um, numerous knife fights and killings, um, both at the hands of prisoners and guards. He sent two shooters up there. They went into the side door. They shot Gary, who was on the couch. They went into the bedroom. They took Margot's two six-year-old twin daughters. They laid them on the bed, wrapped their arms around their teddy bears. They held Margot, and then they shot the little girls in the head while they made her watch, and then they shot her in the head. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Michael Thompson. First of all, Michael, I just want to say thanks for coming on the show. My pleasure, James. Very fascinating story, Michael. You've just spent over 45 years in prison for mm -hmm. a double murder that you've always said you were innocent with. And uh, mm -hmm. you just got released last year. While you were in prison, you one of the leading members of the Aryan Brotherhood. Um, yes. One of the biggest gangs in America. Mm -hmm. unbelievable story i've watched a few of your documentaries you seem a very mm -hmm. humble you seem a very cool man as well but obviously not a man to be messed with back in the day but like i say first of all just want to say thanks for coming on the show my pleasure i always go back to the start with my guest michael where you grew up and how it all began mm. well i grew up um on and off the reservation big pine reservation it was in um it's at the base of Mount Whitney. It's on the uh, eastern side of the High Sierras here in California. And um, then when I was 12 years old, I went to live with um, my elder, uh, he who walks on top of the wind. I just called him Walks on Top. Um, he had a, an Arabian horse ranch, ran Black Angus cattle. And um, I spent, uh, I guess, six, seven years with him. And um, not too long after that, I um, found myself charged with uh, two counts of murder and um, went through the trial, was convicted, and um, ended up in prison, started at Chino. That's a California institution for men, Chino, California. And um, it, was, um, <laughs> it was a rude awakening. How old were you, Michael? Hmm? How old were you? I was 20. I just turned 22. And what was your life like before that? With Did you go to school? Yeah, I went to school. The problem was is that um, I couldn't uh, read or write. 
um, the school on the reservation, you just showed up for roll call and uh, then you left. And, but I'm dyslexic and, and not much was known about dyslexia back then. So um, I played sports and sports kind of carried me through. Um, I managed as a result of playing sports to get D's in most of my classes, but then I got an A in, in physical education class and then an A in wood shop and the things that uh, didn't re really require me to uh, study or for that matter, think. And um, so I, I graduated high school and, um, but my life was uh, um, working with horses and uh, I rode the rodeo circuit. I was a bull rider and um, herding cattle. So everything that goes typically along with um, ranch life, um, you know, you have your spring roundup so that you care for your cattle and dehorn them, castrate them, give them their shots, and um, call those that are going to go to market. But um, my um, joy, I suppose, was working with the horses. Um, I've always loved horses, and uh, particularly Arabians. I do have a bias there. And um, so in addition to riding horses and and uh, taking care of the ranch, uh, riding rodeo circuit. Um, that was about it up until the time. Matter of fact, I just come on, I had just come off the rodeo circuit uh, prior to being arrested. So, um, and getting involved in this entire case. So it, uh, I think within 90 days, something like that, um, didn't take too long. So your life kind of turned upside down. Were you loving life before that, Michael? Were you violent? Were you in prison before? Were you causing trouble? Mm, that... No, no, I'd never been in trouble, never been arrested. And um, I mean, you know, when you ride the rodeo circuit, um, you get in fights. Um, usually when you best, in my case, I was a youngster. So if I had bested the older bull riders in the bull ring, um, that night we would camp around the... Um, um, the rodeo ring, usually there's an olive grove that surrounds the rodeo rings. And um, we'd camp out there. And more times than not, the older cowboys would get liquored up and and uh, come looking for me because I'd bested them in the bull ride. So uh, you had those type of altercations where um, you squared up and, um, you know, um, you would fight. But it wasn't anything like fighting in prison. Um, you know, I was fortunate in that um, my elder walks on top had taught me martial arts over the six years that I was with him. And so that um, that helped me a lot. And I was a big kid, um, you know, by, well, let's see, when I was 12 years old, I was already over six feet and weighed um, 220. And um, by the time I was 18, uh, I was 6'4 and weighed 280. So um, you couple that with the inability to fight and um, the core strength that comes from doing ranch work. And you can be uh, a force to be reckoned with. What What was family life like? Did you have a big family, Michael? No, I mean, I have a large family, but um, um my mother wasn't able to take care of all the kids. That's how I ended up on the reservation. And then ultimately with my elder, um, I was placed with him actually um, through foster care in California. And, um, and that was a blessing. I mean, imagine for a 12 year old boy uh, to be um, settled, housed with um, a rancher, um, hundreds of acres uh, up in the mountains, Cleveland National Forest, um, you know, working with horses, working with cattle, um, everything that comes with ranch life, fishing, hunting. So it was a blessing. Um, yeah. Nature. Was, yes. So a kid, 12 years old, dyslexic, feels as if he's abandoned, that was working with the horses, nature, was that your, your getaway, Michael? Was that your freedom? Well, you felt alive? It was. Well, yeah, my, my elder taught me my, my ways. We we call it the Red Road. So I was raised native. 
and um and so we would go to gatherings and we'd attend sweat lodges and ceremonies and i would dance and sing and and um participate in in the gatherings and uh, so we traveled um really all over uh, doing just that and uh, would travel by horseback uh, sometimes from the ranch down into mexico to the villages and um we'd have ceremony down there so my life was pretty much consumed with um, my spirituality um horses cattle fishing hunting um as you say nature yeah, that's what I believe life is at. And I see your dream catchers in the back there and your feathers. Like, my house is full of dream catchers and feathers, and I love nature. Like, I love the native yeah. belief, the beliefs as well. Like, how hard was it being a native, though, in the 60s and 70s in America? Was a lot of things calmed down then? Or was there still a lot of violence against the natives? Yeah, there was. I mean, you, you have to remember that, well, I'll just give you by way of example, James, that um, when I went to prison, it was against the law to practice our ways. So we weren't even allowed to speak our language because if they couldn't understand your language, they didn't know what you were saying, so they wouldn't allow you to speak it. But more than that, you had the three dominant religions, um, uh, Christianity and um, Islam and Judaism. And um, other than that, no other re religions were really recognized. So to practice my ways in prison was actually forbidden. But... Um, I was blessed in that the first job that I had in prison was uh, for the chaplain. And he was a Protestant chaplain. And we had an agreement that if I took care of the chapels, he would allow me to use the garden to practice my ways. And I did. So I was able to go out there and dance and sing and and um, commune, if you will, with, with nature to the extent that you can behind the Iron Gates. It, it can be difficult. Years later... Uh, with the passage in 1978 of the American Indian Religious Freedom Act, um, we were allowed to bring sweat lodges behind the Iron Gates and did. So we built sweat lodges and we would conduct sweats and ceremonies. And um, so we were able to uh, participate in our way of life, even behind the Iron Gates. And that made a huge difference uh, in my incarceration. But... Um, mm. Before we get into the deep stuff, Michael, like, I know yeah. the na natives are, because I'm very intrigued by the natives' beliefs, like, why is the eagle so important to the natives? Well, it depends. You'll see an eagle fan over my shoulder here, and then there's um, eagle feathers that are beaded hanging from the eagle portrait that I have there. That particular um, painting um, took first place here in California in 1991-92. It's called American Majesty. And, um, but the eagle has different meanings for different nations, but the common thread that runs through that is vision. And you see that in nature. You see the eagle has extraordinary vision. It can see a fish in the water a mile up and then come down and take that fish. Uh, the, the, um, the American eagle is um, a fisher eagle, so it primarily fishes. But it's the, the vision. It is said among some of the nations, for instance, that um, the eagle carries our prayers under its wing to great mystery. And, um, you know, there's, um, like I said, it, it depends on the nation that you're talking about. But typically it has to do with um, vision. You'll find some people that will take the eagle as a totem. But uh, we use it um, um, in the context of a grandfather. And the feathers that you see behind me are part of my regalia. So I not only dance with them, but I smudge with them. And um, it's a cleansing ceremony. And so the, the grandfather eagle serves us in that capacity. And there are a multitude of reasons that um, various nations have for um, using um, the eagle as a totem. I sh should perhaps clarify that you know, when we pray as natives, we don't pray to the eagle, for instance. Uh, we pray to great mystery. And oftentimes the eagle is our guide in that. So that, as I said, when I smudge myself, when I smoke the pipe and I send my prayers, oftentimes I'll call upon the eagle to carry those prayers under its wing to great mystery. And um, But it's primarily 
uh, the visionary aspects associated with uh, the eagle itself. What's in the pipe, Michael? Well, it depends. If you're using the long pipe, which is the people's pipe, um, then you have ceremony. You have typically seven different ceremonies associated with that. So um, I had the privilege of holding the people's hot pipe behind the iron gates for 25 years and conducted um, hundreds of ceremonies with it. But it depends on the ceremony that you're conducting. So um, if you're doing a healing ceremony, for instance, um, then you would uh, take your medicines, um, which are herbs, but first and foremost amongst them would be tobacco. Tobacco is our first medicine. So we use tobacco uh, as a gift from Great Mystery and the Mother um, as our first medicine to call spirit and to send spirit. So you would take tobacco and you would mix that, say, with, uh, oftentimes it's referred to as a kinikinik. So a kinikinik is a mixture of medicines for a specific ceremony. So that if I was doing a healing ceremony, then I would start with tobacco, then I might take deer tongue and sage and other medicines and mix those, and then I combine it. And then I load the pipe with a um, pipe loading song and um, and then have ceremony with that. Then when you light the pipe, you light it from the coals of the spirit fire. And um, then you open the pipe with four breaths of smoke on the pipe stem. And then you begin your ceremony. And like I said, there are typically seven different ceremonies associated with the people's pipe. Now, if you have a personal pipe, and I have a number of those also, um, you'll see one over my left shoulder. Uh, that's a personal pipe. And so I might use that just in personal ceremony. Uh, oftentimes when I take my regalia out in the morning here, um, I have a lake that's um, just to the east of me and that I can see from here. And um, I'll do my morning ceremony, smudge myself off, load my pipe, um, say my prayers. And so it's, it's used in the personal context there. Typically the people's pipe is used in ceremony um, for the people. Yeah, obviously there's so many religions now, there's so many different beliefs, but what's the natives' beliefs, Michael? What's their true yeah. core beliefs in life? Yeah, they they're they're there's a commonality that runs between most um native cultures. And um their beliefs <clears throat> excuse me, vary, but they're nature based. So what we find is we we have, of course, reverence for great mystery. There are many names for it. Uh, Wankantanka amongst the Lakota, you know, um, um, Gatichi Manitou amongst the Anishinaabe. Um, but it all translates to great spirit or great mystery. And, um, you know, I typically use great mystery in reference to mine, but we use a uh, relationship to all of nature. So the tree people, we don't refer to uh, trees is just trees, but they're people. We refer, refer to the rock people as, as that, <clears throat> the four-legged, the winged ones, the finned ones. Um, I'm water clan, so we believe that everything comes from the water and, um, and that everything has a voice is, I, I suppose, one of the key characteristics that by saying that everything has a voice, that um, as my elder used to tell me, that if you open your heart to the spirit of whatever that is, it will speak to you. And so it's about relationships. So I have a relationship with the tree people. I live here amongst the great redwoods. And um, they, of course, have a voice. And they communicate with each other. And so it's understanding that intimacy that exists in nature. And the opportunity that I have as a human being, a two-legged, uh, to have a relationship um, with all my relations. So amongst the Lakota, again, you know, it would be um, that would mean um, essentially that um, you're giving thanks to great mystery. And, um, you know, I wish to live amongst all my relations, all my relatives. So um, it would be um, one aspect you know, with the Anishinaabe, you know, it would be different. You know, it would be in their language. A prayer to uh, Wai Bunung, which um, is um, a spirit that dwells in the east, and um, one that we rely upon heavily uh, towards guiding us. Um, 
Mugwe Janini would be another one. Uh, but we have names and creation stories uh, for all the things that I'm talking about. It depends on what nation that that um, we're making reference to and what they're using. The Sweat Lodge, for instance, with the Lakota uh, has 30 different aspects. There's a cosmology associated with that. Now, I won't get too deep into that because that's um, something that all nations hold dear to themselves and uh, privately. So typically to discuss these things, it requires permission. But I can speak about them in generalities without going too deep into the uh, creation stories themselves um, or the um, significance to the people. But yeah. um, to answer your question, the the significance of um, all Native life is its relationship to great mystery, um, the Sky Father, which is the sun, and... Um, Grand, grandmother Moon, uh, relationship to the rest of the planets and the star people. It is the star people where we make our dream journeys to. Um, for instance, when we put the bear to sleep, uh, some nations don't do that, but most nations will put the bear to sleep in the fall. And so then when the great medicine bear makes its dream journey to the star people, you know, we also have that opportunity to do the same thing. So yeah. it's the reason it's why not, I'm try to yeah. get so deep into this michael just i wonder what the connections are like going through life like you talk about the mystery of life where well, you get 45 mm -hmm. years you say you're innocent that obviously we'll get deeper into the conversation but i want to feel how you connected are to your native ways to then everything that happened in your life and how everything's connected and how you see it obviously your mm -hmm. life changed at 22 years old when mm -hmm. there was a double murder you spent over mm -hmm. 45 years in prison like, how did that happen? What had happened was that uh, two individuals, they were drug dealers, and um, they had a plan, apparently, to kidnap two little girls of one of the individuals that uh, was running a cartel, drug cartel here in California. And um, so my wife at the time, her cousin, was working with him. And he had let me know one evening during a phone call that this kidnap was going to occur, and I told him that he needed to call the father and let the father of those children know that this was going to happen. He wouldn't do it, so I got the phone number and I called him and let him know. And um, that was really the extent of my participation in this whole affair, uh, was letting this man know that his children were going to be kidnapped. But what happened was that subsequently, when these two individuals attempted to kidnap the girls, of course, the father was now aware, and um, both individuals were killed during their attempt uh, to kidnap these little girls. And uh, they were killed with their own weapons. Their weapons were taken away from them, and they were killed, and they were buried. But like I said, that was the extent of my participation. Um, you know, when I went to trial, and they arrested me. Um, and, uh, you know, my defense was is that I, didn't, I knew nothing about this other than what I just told you, and that's, of course, what I told the jury. But uh, there were other people, my co-defendants, that were testifying against me, saying that I concocted this plot about a kidnap plot, and the reason I did was to steal away with one of the victim's wives, and none of that was true. Um, so my only resort at that point was to take polygraph tests. Um, that's a lie detector test. So I did that. I took two of them. I took one from the FBI, and I took one from the Department of Justice. I passed both, but they were not admissible in court. Um, at any rate, I was convicted. Um, the interesting thing about that, James, is that I'm now back in court and just received a ruling from the appellate court here in California, 4th District, that set aside one of those murder convictions. Well, let me clarify that. It's not set aside yet. I filed a petition. The court denied it. I appealed it. The appellate court granted it and sent me back to court. So now I'm back in court on the merits and um, I have every reason to believe that one of the convictions will be set aside. Now, we're having to go on to the California Supreme Court with the other conviction. But ultimately, what I'm after here is exoneration. And I believe I will arrive at that exoneration at some point in the near future. It's taken a long time. You that's know, it's been, almost 50, it's been almost 50 years. Yeah, but, that's a um, That's a lifetime for some people. It is. But, um, you know, I was steadfast 
in my innocence at the time of trial and maintained my innocence the whole time that I was incarcerated. So I went to the Board of Parole hearings uh, 18 times. The 19th time, they released me. But each one of those 18 times, they wanted me to admit to the crime, and I wouldn't do that. Um, so um, not only because um, I was innocent, but on principle. So I probably could have been released had I admitted to the crime, um, but I just simply was not going to do that on principle. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to admit to something that I didn't do. So, you know, hopefully that's all being rectified now. But in the meantime, um, you know, I was sent off to prison. And um, what, so what evidence? Forty-five years. Look, what evidence did they have against you, Michael? Was that a setup, or was it? Racism, no, what they, that... no, what they essentially had was the testimony of my co-defendants. They never said that I killed anybody, but they did. One of the co-defendants said that I did assault one of the victims and that in that assault um, under the felony murder rule here in California, based on his testimony and his testimony alone, saying that I was present and that I assaulted one of the victims, um, that by virtue of lying in wait to assault this individual, that based on what's called the felony murder rule. In other words, if you commit a felony, in this case, an assault, and um, the person dies subsequently to that, then you're guilty of whatever that crime is, in this case, murder. So the co-defendant admitted killing both victims, but because he said that I had assaulted one of them, then under the felony murder rule, I was convicted of both murders. Now, Last year, the California legislature uh, threw out the felony murder rule and revised it. And so that if you were just a aider and a better, which was the case with me based on the assault, then um, whereas I was found guilty, now the new law says that you can't be found guilty. So that allowed me to go back into court and have these murder charges removed. And that's where I'm at right now with it. So it was just simply his testimony um, saying that I was present. And um, again, this was based on um, he and my other co-defendant, who was the father of these children, uh, testifying that I concocted this kidnap plot. Well, when the co-defendant went before the board, he acknowledged that the two victims had approached him about the kidnap plot and wanted him to help them kidnap the children. Now, that was evidence that didn't come out in court, but he had to testify under oath before the board, so now we have that testimony. And that helps me, of course, because it's completely contrary to his original testimony. Were you there, and, Michael, when the two kids get murdered, two boys get murdered? No, I wasn't. You know, like I said, my only involvement in this was to call the father and tell him of this, um, what was going to be an attempt to kidnap his children. I felt that as a father, he had a right to know that. I didn't care about his business. I didn't care about him, actually. Um, but I did care about the two children and the potential for them to be kidnapped for ransom. And uh, so I made the call to him. And, um, you know, I acknowledged that I did that. And if I had it to do over again, I would do the same thing. Um, that is what was important to me, yeah. was that the father know that, these, that his children were going to be kidnapped. And uh, like I said, when that attempt was made, um, the two individuals that were making the attempt were killed. So at 22 years old, your whole life ahead of you, spiritual mm -hmm. guy, love horses, love in nature, try to do the mm -hmm. right thing and help save girls, it then backfires to be then doing mm. life in prison. On the mm. day of sentencing, Michael, did you know that you were going to get a guilty? Well, um, I really didn't know anything. You know, I was a fish. Like I said, I'd never been arrested, never been in trouble. And so I didn't, um, we referred to somebody that's new to the prison system as a fish. And um, I was definitely a fish. I didn't know anything about it. So there was a huge learning curve as it relates to that. But the biggest thing that I had to contend with uh, almost immediately was the idea of being uh, housed in a cage. You know, I, I hold to this day that the, the um, 
the absolutely worst thing that you can do to a human being is put them in a cage. And um, that's what they did with me. They put me in a cage. Now, I'd been living in the mountains, running the mountains, and um, had no idea what it was like to be caged. But that was the only time in my life, James, that I ever contemplated suicide. Because I was standing in a cell, and I looked around me, and I thought, mm, I can't do this. I cannot do this. Um, but there was a rock person that was sticking, protruding out from the side of the wall, high up on the cell wall. And I saw it, and I went up and I put my hand on it. And it's just like this rock that I wear around my neck, and that's why I wear this rock around my neck, just like that. And I went up and I put my hand on it, and it spoke to me. And all it said was, it's going to be all right, little one. And that's all I needed. You know, my spirituality um, was there for me. You know, uh, the spirit of the rock person spoke to me. And um, from then on, I was good. Um, it didn't make it any easier to live in that cage, but I did have my spirituality. And uh, even though I, didn't, I wasn't allowed to have my regalia, you know, I would make things. You know, I would save the... Uh, um, you know, you have stone fruit, like peaches and nectarines and that. And so that if we got those, which was rare, but we did get them, you know, I would save those in myself because that gave me a connection to nature. Um, if we were given, for instance, um, grapefruit, you get a half a grapefruit. So I would um, take the pith out of that grapefruit half and I would put it up in the air vent and I would dry it. And then I'd wait for another half to come. And I'd put that up in the vent and dry it. Then I'd wait for an apple. And when an apple would come, I would dry the seed, dry the, excuse me, dry the seeds. Then um, I would take the lining out of my boxer shorts and I would sew the two halves of the grapefruit together with the apple seeds inside. And I'd take paper and I'd burnish it and I'd braid it around the um, sewed together grapefruit halves and that was my rattle so now i had a rattle and in my culture a rattle represents the first sound heard in the universe so that's we use our rattles uh to call spirit and send spirit so you'll see that you know i'm surrounded by rattles here i have a turtle rattle up here i have a gourd rattle up over here and i use those every day to call spirit well i did the same thing with those grapefruit halves so that allowed me to connect with nature, with my spirituality, even even in the dungeon. And I spent time, a lot of time in the dungeon. So um, I always found a way. Uh, I would have mice come into my cell. So, you know, those became my relatives. I would have scorpions and snakes and spiders, and those became my relatives. So, you know, when I was in solitary confinement, and I spent many years in solitary confinement, you know, I would connect with these relatives. And um, that made it easier for me. But, you know, as I advanced in my pursuit of education, I eventually became a biologist. And um, I did so because of my spirituality. I thought that because of my spirituality, the biology, the study of life, would be a good field to enter. And it didn't quite work out that way because science is much different. Um, but it allowed me to further my knowledge as it relates to my spirituality. And I did that um, and continue to do that to this day. So while I had those things available to me, while I was pursuing my education and learning to read and learning to write, because I couldn't read or write when I went to prison, but eventually I, I taught myself how to read and write. Um, chaplain England, the chaplain I first worked for, he started me on the path to that. And he was the first one that realized that I was dyslexic. So he would bring me magazines and different things that on fishing and hunting, uh, horsemanship, things that I would identify with. And that helped me learn to comprehend what I was reading. And, um, and then later in Old Folsom, you know, the Black Gorilla family and, and um, the Black Panthers would read Mao's Little Red Book on the tier. And I would get a copy of it and I would follow along. So I improved my reading skills by doing things like that. Mm -hmm. But... Where I was going with that, and the idea that uh, the worst thing that you can do with a human being is put him in a cage, 
is that when I became a biologist, um, I came across um, a piece on um, in uh, zoology that dealt with um, what's called zoocosis. And zoocosis is when they capture a wild animal uh, in nature and they bring it in and they put it in a cage and the animal cannot stand it. So it either kills itself or it dies of natural causes from the stress of being caged. And so I use that by way of analogy to term, um, to coin the term, um, pinkosis. So penitentiary and, and psychosis. So pinkosis is when you take a human being and you put them in a cage. And I've seen many, many people perish, die, commit suicide, or just simply die as a result of being in a cage. And um, that is, I think, perhaps the greatest struggle that any prisoner anywhere in the world as a human being has with being in a cage is surviving that. And what you have to do to maintain your sanity and um, your spirituality, if you have it, um, and your health, your physical health, because it breaks all those things down. You deteriorate. Your mind deteriorates. Your body deteriorates. And um, you perish. Yeah, but the most important one, Mike, I'd imagine it kills your soul. But that's why it's so good to touch on the, the, your beliefs at the start, like yes. your spirituality, because I wanted to know if you would maybe turned against your beliefs because you've been just been sentenced to life for a double murder you've never done. A lot of people would have turned their back on their beliefs, but you didn't. You kind of focused more on those beliefs and started to... That's what saved your life, basically. Well, I agree with you, James. It is what saved my life, um, that connection. But I want to emphasize that in my pursuit of survival, that I compromised my spirituality by being so violent. Um, there was a point in time in the course of my incarceration when I was extremely violent. Um, I've been involved in many knife fights. I've been shot many times. Um, there's been a lot of bloodletting. And in, in, in my culture, we call it having blood on your hands. So it even became an issue when the elders brought people's pipe to me. There was objection by many people because I had so much blood on my hands. But what they don't understand about a pipe holder uh, in that context is that his responsibility is to serve the people. And in serving the people is to sue for peace whenever possible. But if that's not possible, then more times than not, he will lead into warfare. So he is a warrior in addition to being a pipe holder. But in my case, I compromised my spirituality by becoming involved with the Aryan Brotherhood, um, which was a prison gang and a faction of organized crime and those things actually went contrary to my spirituality and the idea that uh, my goal, my purpose in life is to serve my way of life and to help people. And um, being a member of the Aryan Brotherhood went uh, totally contrary to that. So um, it was four or five, six years into that that I received a visit from um, a number of elders who were attending a gathering and in the Pacific Northwest. And they simply told me, that this is at San Quentin, they came in and they told me, you're serving two truths. You're serving two fires. And you cannot serve two fires. You must choose. And so I did. I chose my way of life and my spirituality. And there were a number of things that went along with that. There were things happening that I did not agree with that were contrary to my belief system. And so I, I reached a point where I did have to choose. Was I going to condone the activities that I was involved in, the violence toward innocent people? Um, was I going to step back on the road, the good red road, and uh, acknowledge my purpose in life? And I made that decision. Yeah. And um, But you're absolutely correct um, in your thinking, James, about the idea that it was my, my spirituality that was my salvation. And it was my spirituality that brought me back to step back on the good red road and to um, reconnect with my humanity. 
because there was a number of years there when I was not a very good human being. I certainly wasn't an example um, to the younger men and women in my culture that would otherwise have looked up to um, a pipe holder or a lodge leader um, or somebody that professed to be um, spiritual. So, um, yeah. what was your first day in prison like, Michael? Hmm. It was um, culture shock, I guess, is the best way to explain it. Um, because you're dealing with um, a subculture of society that has its own rules. And, um, and then, of course, you have the prison administration rules. But um, that's an entirely different thing. The ones that govern prison are those that are established. They, they called it the convict code. So that's the do's and don'ts of prison. And so you just kind of feel your way through. My first uh, day in prison was kind of finding my way through uh, the ins and outs of where you go. Uh, you know, you, you're given a cell, you're assigned a cell. Um, you go through a series of tests psychological evaluations, you see a psych, uh, they test your IQ, um, and then you're, you're um, mingling, if you will, with um, other prisoners. So you, you kind of get a sense of your environment. You take that in, um, you know, where your place might be in that environment. Uh, what kind of job can you get? Um, so, you know, prison is about hustle. So everybody's got to hustle. And um, so you learn these things. And, and there's, a, there's an enormous learning curve as it relates to that. But the um, key thing for me was to um, maintain my integrity, one, as a man, as a human being, and um, to be my own man. And uh, so that was my focus because you're there's an onslaught of... Um, influences and that's from drugs to alcohol to gangs i mean it's just um a multitude of different things as a youngster that you're looking at and that um you have choices to make and um so those choices determine your place your standing within the environment in which you live and that can be very stressful it um and can take a minute. It yeah. can take a minute. How many gangs were in those prisons in the seventies, Michael? That did you get approached every day with different gangs, or was it just their in brotherhood straight away? Like how? What was the process? No, no it did. Um, you know, at the reception center, you don't typically have gangs that are organized. You have a permanent work crew, and it isn't to say that there aren't gang members associated with that, but you have no recruitment process. So the reception center is just where you go through these battery of tests and then you're shipped off to another prison like San Quentin or Folsom, Tracy, Soledad, and so on. And then that's where your gangs have standing. That's where they have their strongholds. So in Old Folsom and San Quentin, that was a stronghold for um, the Aryan Brotherhood and the Mexican Mafia. And then you had um, other groups like the Black Panthers, Black Guerrilla Family, Texas Syndicate, and the Western Familia, and the Western Familia stronghold was in Tracy, and that's where I was sent to. So that's where the recruitment process begins. Now, um, I got into a wreck with the Western Familia Tracy and ended up being shipped out as a result of my violence to Old Folsom. So when I arrived in Old Folsom, that's really what they called the big house. That's where the big boys are at. So all your leaders of those groups I just mentioned were there, in addition to Charlie Manson and his group and and um, um, Joe Romero and the Sibonese Liberation Army and other groups. So, and these were all men that were older than I was. I was the youngest person there. And uh, so, again, that was an educative process. So the first group that attempted to recruit me uh, because they knew that I was raised Native was the Black Panthers. And that was um, Hugo Yogi Pinnell. He was their leader. And he attempted to recruit me, and I declined. So the next day, we went head up in a knife fight. 
And he ended up losing the knife fight, but I ended up being shot. And um, so there was um, a succession of events, all violent, that followed that. Then the Aryan Brotherhood attempted to recruit me, and I declined them. Um, ultimately, at one point, four members of the Aryan Brotherhood, who were also native, approached me. And essentially what they told me was um, that they lived better in prison than they ever did on the res. And they knew I was an old res dog. And, um, you know, the res I grew up on was um, tar paper shacks, dirt floors. They had a few 12-foot teardrop travel trailers. But, you know, the time I spent on the res, I slept underneath a trailer. I never slept inside. And it was abject poverty. So when these four individuals with the Aryan Brotherhood, natives, told me that they lived, lived better in prison than they ever did on the res, that resonated with me. I understood that. So they began to under, to explain to me how they controlled their resources as members of the Aryan Brotherhood. And that's really what all the gangs were about back then, was controlling their resources. And you had a population that ran from 3,000 to 6,000, depending on where you're talking about it, Old Folsom or San Quentin, and um, a lot of money available there by way of revenues uh, for drug trafficking, alcohol, prostitution, loan sharking, um, commodities in general, um, jobs, the gangs controlled all the jobs, positions of those jobs, the pay numbers associated with those jobs, and so on. So uh, that appealed to me. That's the reason I actually decided to join the Aryan Brotherhood. Do you think um, you were maybe manipulated to join them as well at, at a young age? Well, you know, it's easy enough to say that. You know, no man likes to think that he's... Um, vulnerable to manipulation, but certainly I was. And as I said, um, you know, what these natives, um, three were were Pit River and one was Maidu. And, um, you know, it actually made sense to me. Logically, it made sense to me that if I was going to live in this kind of environment, um, then I wanted to control that environment. I didn't want to be controlled by it. So, you know, I was persuaded, certainly. Manipulated? I don't think so. But yes, I was persuaded, and yeah. um, it, it it just made it made good sense to me. You know, before I um, before I was thirty, I stepped away from the brand. Um, so it didn't take that long uh, to realize that I was caught up in something that was um, certainly much bigger than I was, um, and that. Um, it was involved in activities that um, just absolutely went contrary to everything I believed. Yeah. As I said, as the old elders told me, I was living two truths, and I had to make a decision, mm -hmm. and I did. So, say when you have a like a knife off, like, why was it not just a fight? Like, who comes up with the idea? Okay, get a knife, and then we'll meet you the next day. Like, how was that possible? Why not just have a fight with your fists? Mm. Fist fighting really isn't uh, very effective in prison. Um, and it typically isn't condoned because if you're in a fist fight, usually when a fight occurs, they're going to lock down the prison. And, uh, if you, if you're in a fight, then you on, you're confined to quarters for 10 days, depending on if you were shot or stabbed and, you know, your wounds are healed and then they do a risk assessment and you know, what it does is it disrupts business. So fist fighting is not condoned and, um, knife fighting on the other hand, as a matter of principle, in this case, you know, when Yogi uh, attempted to recruit me, um, you know, he essentially he expressed their communist manifesto, and um, I'm not going to embrace communism. I didn't really understand. I was too young and really too stupid to understand what communism was, but I knew that I was an American and that I wasn't going to embrace communism. So when I denied him, what he said to me was that, um, he called me Young Mike. He said, Young Mike, he says, you're either with us or you're against us. And I said, well, then I'm against you. And he said, well, all right, Young Mike, then you you go ahead and you go on in and you make yourself a knife and I'll meet you out here in the morning. So it was a matter of face. In other words, you cannot deny you're with them or you're against them. And uh, that's the politic of gangs in prison. And um, so I did. I went in that night and I made a knife and I came out the next morning and he had a knife and 
we engaged in a knife fight and we were being shot at the whole time. And, and, uh, ultimately he ran when he started to lose and I chased him and he had two bodyguards that attempted to intercede. And I got into a knife fight with them. And during that with them, I was shot, I was shot in the back. And, um, so that put me down, but it was the same way. I mean, you know, when I was approached to join the Aryan Brotherhood, same thing, I declined and, um, I didn't know that was unheard of. You didn't decline uh, membership in the Aryan Brotherhood. There were many people who were trying to get in, and it was a very elite and exclusive organization. Uh, very few people were members. And that was based on the uh, requirements that um, they had to meet. Uh, physical prowess, first and foremost, and the ability to control your environment by yourself. In other words, nobody else. That you could walk into any prison and take over that prison. And you had to have that capacity, um, physically, first and foremost, but also uh, intellectually, um, to control your environment. What and, was it like uh, getting shot, Michael? Mm, well, uh, it was interesting. It, um, it dropped me, of course, and it takes your wind. And um, in this case, I was shot with uh, an M14, which is a, a um, 223 round fairly hot round. It was developed during World War II as a sniper uh, rifle. And the idea was is that uh, the round was so hot that it would pass through the victim that the sniper was shooting at. And the purpose was is that when that victim would fall, others would come out to help him and the sniper would have more victims. So in this case, when I was shot, the gunner was 50 feet up on a wall. And so the trajectory of the um, uh, projectile was such that it came down uh, in such a way that it struck me in the back and it lodged next to my spine instead of passing through me. Now, had it passed through me, it probably would have taken my guts with it, but it didn't. And apparently, the spin on it was such that it lodged next to my spine and that's where it stayed, but it dropped me like a sack of potatoes and took my wind. Um, and so I was taken to the hospital and they probed it and the doctor decided that because of where it was at next to my spine to leave it. He wasn't going to do surgery. So he left it. But uh, paralysis set in and, you know, they put me in my cell for 10 days and, and um, they would slide a, a food tray um, up underneath the door. And um, I would just, it would take me about a, uh, an hour because of the paralysis to roll over and I'd just stick my face in the tray and eat what I could. And then it'd take me about another hour to roll back over. And, um, you know, that's um, that was my introduction to the three-inch cockroaches at Old Folsom. You know, I was in a strip cell, and it only had a hole in the floor. That's all I had. And the cockroaches would come up through that hole in the floor, and they would come up my body, and I couldn't lift my arms. Um, so they would come up and eat the food off my face. And um, being confronted with that, I just simply named them. And so, you know, every time I ate, then they would come up and they would eat. And, and by then I knew them by name. So um, eventually uh, I went back out to the yard, but uh, I still couldn't. Um, it was only 10 days later. Uh, I couldn't lift my arms and I could only shuffle step. And I went back out to the yard and uh, four blacks took me to the ground and stabbed me. And uh, I couldn't defend myself. And um, so then I had to recover from that also. So it was a succession of um, events that were all violent. And either um, I was being shot or stabbed um, in my altercations. And, um, you know, the, the blessing in that, uh, the opportunity, if you will, uh, as a bias in that was that um, I had been trained by my elder. And so that training prepared me for this level of violence. And um, I told uh, David Grant with uh, New Yorker magazine one time that, um, you know, because he was asking about the violence. And um, I told him that uh, I deplore violence, and I do. Um, I, I have no appreciation whatsoever for violence. But um, the fact of the matter is I'm very good at it. And so... With that said, it was that that actually was my salvation, my training. And so, you know, I maintain that training even to this day. Yeah. How uh, hard is that then? Yeah. How hard is that then, Michael, to be 
in prison for two murders that he didn't do, to then stabbing people, to then being shot. Like, was that when you had to just register in your mind that, okay, it's kill or be killed mentality? Yes, it is a matter of survival. And it is kill or be killed. I never actually took life. I didn't have to. My skill set was sufficient enough that I could defeat my opponents um, without having to kill them. Unfortunately, uh, I was shot a number of times. Um, but, you know, I survived that and lived through that. And the key to a knife fight in the joint is you keep moving. And uh, because you're moving, it makes you a difficult target. So, you know, you may take um, most, well, I was shot five times once with a shotgun. And that was, um, the gunner was only eight feet off the floor. He was up in a tower just above the fence. And so all he did was lean over the tower. And it's what I refer to as point blank range. So I took five rounds in the back. And um, uh, the doctor told me if I didn't have the mass on me of muscle, that it would have penetrated my heart and my lungs. But because of the mass I had, the shot, um, I still have hundreds of shot in me um, from that. But um, that was probably the most difficult time. Other than that, being shot is, it either passes through, it knocks you down. Um, as long as it doesn't hit anything vital, um, you know, they probe it. If they need to sew it up, they sew it up. They put a plug in it um, and um, you heal. So um, I was never stabbed sufficiently to where um, it required anything um, I mean, I've sutured myself up. I've set my own bones. I've broken bones. And and um, you do most of that yourself. Um, so, again, uh, that those are things that my elder actually prepared me for. Um, I grew up, I think, exposed to catastrophic events. Fire, flood, um, you know, dealing with animals, uh, hunting, particularly when you hunt bear. Um, so that when situations would occur that others would consider catastrophic, I developed a way to contend with those. And so when I went to prison, I had that um, experience with me so that when confronted with a catastrophic event, I didn't panic. And I will say that the first time I went out to the yard and engaged in a knife fight, that everything happened very, very quick. It was hard to keep account of everything that was going on. But by the fourth time I went out, everything slowed down to almost slow motion. And that's because our brain has what's called a virtual reality. Um, and it, it creates this virtual reality of the yard, what's in the yard. And so you no longer have to assess that in your brain because your brain's already done it. And so you acquire that by way of a skill set. And um, I won't say that it becomes easier. It doesn't. But uh, uh, it's less difficult. Uh, to contend with. So you develop a new skill set as it relates to knife fighting and the violence, avoid being shot, at least being shot in the head. You know, as I've, I've taken shots in the leg and and um, other areas of the body, but uh, I've never had a, a, a vital organ hit. So um, yeah. that's as a result of um, the method of fighting. What's the difference from hunting a bear to then will stab in a bear or stab in a human do you find it the same or is it totally different when you become so immune to it like like you say life or death did you feel it the mm. same or was it's it it's a different? great question yeah I, I actually use the analogy in my writings um the bear hunt itself you know when i hunted bear i hunted bear with bow and arrow and so uh, typically if you're hunting bear and the bear is one of the few animals, it and the tiger, that'll turn around and hunt you. And so when you're hunting a bear with bow and arrow, if that bear charges, and oftentimes they do, um, you have to take their shoulders out first. So that means that you're when, while the bear is charging you, you have to knock your arrow and um, fire and hit the bear in the shoulder and incapacitate that shoulder. And usually it takes both shoulders. And then you take a vital. So... And then you can go up with your knife afterwards and you can cut its throat. Um, so, you know, for those who have been charged by a bear and know how that feels, um, you have to stand your ground. 
So you have to stay calm under that kind of pressure. Uh, when you're dealing with a human being and you're in a knife fight, that's a matter of skill um, with that knife and knowing what you're doing with it. You know, I'd been taught not only how to make knives, but how to use it. And so I had that skill set. Um, but there's nothing. Um, I take no satisfaction in, in stabbing another person. I've done so on a number of occasions. Um, in some of my knife fights, particularly the older knife fights, where you actually had the opportunity to engage in uh, what's called long-term combat, you can bleed your opponent as opposed to stabbing your opponent. So if you bleed your opponent, then they grow weak, and you typically have them. So then the choice is then yours to take their life or not take their life. I always chose not to take their life. I never saw any value in that. If he was defeated, he was defeated. Now, I received a lot of criticism for that because people would say, I left him alive to come back and get me another day. But that never happened. I did have instances where an individual tried to, to stab me uh, where I didn't have a knife. And, um, and attempt, essentially, that was an attempt at assassination. But I took the knife away from him. And when I put him down, he begged for his life. So I tattooed, I choked up on the knife, and I tattooed a series of wounds around his heart to remind him that I had given him his life. Um, but uh, fortunately, as I say, I've never had to take life as a result of my skill set. And um, I'm grateful for that, actually. Um, the violence, it does impact upon you. Um, I'm not a sociopath. I'm not a psychopath. Um, you know, even though I was trained to contend with violence, and even though I had a skill set uh, that enabled me to defeat my opponents, violence still impacts upon you and did me and uh, does to this day. You know, as I tell these stories that I'm telling right now, you know, I'm reliving those in my head. In order to tell the story, I have to see it in my head. Um, it's not just something off the cuff. And so, you know, even right now I'm telling you about my first bear hunt, um, you know, and, and what occurs there, but also my first knife fight. You know, I can see that very vividly. You know, I can, where there's fear involved, and I've been engaged with individuals who have become quite fearful in the course of that fight, uh, you can smell that fear. And, um, you know, when I retell these stories, you know, that scent comes to me. You can smell the blood, you know, that, that copper scent blood. And that comes to me in telling these stories. So what it forms is, is a kind of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And my biggest problem in being released from prison was PTSD, uh, um, sensory overload. It was just too much. After being living in a cage for 45 years, and then just they dropped me in the middle of Los Angeles. And um, it was too much. You seem a very but, cool collective like, character. Like you're so, like you say, it's very calculated from what I see to your mm -hmm. moves. If you were a chess player, I believe you'd be checkmate on every single person because of mm -hmm. the calculated mindset. But mm -hmm. when you're getting asked to join gangs, a man like yourself who's six feet four, over 200 pounds, very strong, very powerful. Mm -hmm. Like, why didn't you choose to fly solo, Michael? Well, you, because I think you see the advantage in survival. You know, you understand what you're dealing with. You take, you take in, you, you assess, if you will, your environment, and you see who's in control. So you're not going to be able to do your own time. That's what they call it. In some capacity, you're going to have to serve the gangs um, in some way. Everybody does. You know, this idea that uh, I'm just going to do my own time doesn't work. So you realize that. So my thinking was is that um, I'm not going to serve the gang by doing my own time. So if I become a member of the gang, then I'm going to take control. And I'm going to control my environment, and I'm going to control the gang. And I did that within a year. I became a leader within a year. And um, so, and that came about organically. I mean, it, it's, I'm, I'm not, I don't mean to make this sound like that was calculated on my part. Um, I was actually too young to have that kind of mindset. But um, I was properly schooled in how to assess my situation, to know my terrain, to know my enemy, to infiltrate that. 
You see, it's a Sun Tzuian characteristic to infiltrate yeah. your enemy. That and then when, that's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, in, and, um, and my elder was an advocate of um, that type of philosophy. And we want to remember that philosophy is really nothing more than uh, the human condition, not human nature. So, you know, the human condition was what I was learning about. And it was a huge learning curve. And so I had decisions to make and choices to make, and I made them. And um, many of those decisions and choices were wrong. And, um, but even in that, you know, people say, well, do you regret it? No, I don't, because I did what I thought I needed to do at the time to survive. Now, as I evolved in my humanity and in my perspectives, as it relates to the environment I was in, I realized that it was not for me and that I couldn't condone it. And so I stepped away. Um, but in doing that, you know, I also had to assume responsibility for that which I had um, helped build by way of infrastructure um, in my leadership role. So, uh, again, that was another decision I had to make, another choice I had to make. And I made that choice. What was the decision? When was the decision to join the Aryan Brotherhood? It was in uh, 77, 78. And um, so, um, and then I stepped away in 83. So you got a good four or five years there where uh, I was heavily involved and um, serving as a leader and um, involved in a lot of activities that uh, had to do with controlling my environment. How many people were in the Aryan Brotherhood in the 70s, Michael? Well, you didn't have more than a dozen at the time. You know, like I said, it was a very small organization. You know, it could have reached as many as 20 at uh, one time. But, um, you know, by comparison to the other gangs who had hundreds, uh, like I said, the format for um, membership in the brand was uh, not only your physical prowess, but your ability to control your environment on your own, by yourself. What does it take to get in the Aryan Brotherhood? Well, I've heard a lot of talk about blood in, blood out. I never experienced that. I was engaged in knife fights and a lot of blood and a lot of violence prior to even being asked to join. So there was no um, stipulation or otherwise or requirement on, um, on my part, nor did I ever require it of anyone else. Uh, one of the first things I did... Um, in developing the infrastructure of the Aryan Brotherhood was to do away with this idea that you put a knife in the hand of an individual that it doesn't have that skill set. You're setting him up for failure. So what was more important to me was to understand and discern what that person's talents were. So he might be good at dealing drugs. He might be good at prostitution. He might be good clerking whatever it might be, moving commodities, whatever it might be, running a still, working the kitchen, foodstuffs. And so then you, as an associate, you cultivate that. So the idea was to cultivate associates that weren't actual members. And that required creating a buffer system, almost a cadre system, if you will, and um, providing an infrastructure. And that's one of the things that I did was providing infrastructure. So, um, I never required of anybody. Um, well, you know, in all the time that I was a member, there was only one person that ever came up for a vote um, for membership, and I declined. I wouldn't I, let him in. I didn't think he was worthy. Um, simply stated. Um, he brought nothing other than... Um, um, a reasonable intelligence, but um, a whole lot of bravado. Um, and bravado doesn't get you there. Um, and arrogance. And uh, I don't think that a warrior needs to be arrogant. I don't think um, that's a requirement of a skill set. Um, I think a warrior is a human being. 
And as such, in my teaching is that a warrior's place is to protect and to provide. And so that if you're in a, a homeland setting, then it's to protect your family, it's to protect your community. That's a warrior's role. Um, but if you arrogantly think that it's about um, violence and, and all that, and you're a bag of chips, and you dominate people, and you're domineering, and um, you hurt people unnecessarily, and this is what I saw in this person. And so I refused to let him in. What was it like then when you st when it started building there in Brotherhood? Is that the first time you, you felt you had a family, Michael? No, the first time I felt I had a family was with my elder. And, you know, I had a I had an incident when I was um, a young boy. Um, I was beaten by Native men. And um, they hurt me pretty bad. And uh, I was able to get away from them. And uh, I ran off into the wilderness, really. And I climbed up on these rocks, mostly for my own safety, um, because they were liquored up. And I, I, I think I thought that uh, they wouldn't be able to climb the rocks. But at any rate, I was up on these rocks, and I was a very young boy. And um, I had, I guess, what uh, most folks would refer to as an epiphany um, or a revelation. But what happened was is that I was looking through the trees, and the huge, magnificent trees, and I had all these rock people around me, and and um, it occurred to me that just as I was aware of my environment, it was aware of me. That was the mother. That was nature. And I heard the wind in the trees. I heard the tree people. I heard the rock people. And... Um, I realized I had a family, and that was my relationship to the mother. And that's actually where my family ties, my relationships began as a young boy. And my love for nature continued. And so I was never very sociable. I mean, only because I didn't have the opportunity. I mean, I lived on a ranch up in the mountains. so. You know, when I went to rodeos, I would I would interact with uh, other bull riders and, and the like. Uh, but, you know, I never drank. I never used drugs. I never saw the need. Um, so, you know, I didn't date um, in high school because I had chores to do. Um, you know, I had horses to look after. And so, um, you know, becoming a member of the Aryan Brotherhood, I think, like any gang, for any person joining any gang, it does become uh, a family. And the gangs actually use that. The, um, the leadership will encourage that to um, manipulate youngsters um, to join the gang. But the key thing to that is the reason they do that is to make them expendable, to use them. And that's what they do. Bar none. Every gang does it. They bring in individuals, they're considered expendables, they're used, and then they're discarded. And um, I know a lot of individuals that I've worked with over the years since I stepped away who were subject to that. And uh, it's very, very traumatic because they believed that they'd finally found a family. You know, they grew up without a family or they grew up without a father. They grew up... Um, you know, in, in the hood or the barrio um, and uh, didn't have a family. And so the gang to them represented for the first time in their life that family. And um, that's what motivated them to, to, to join. And um, to their dismay, um, complete dismay, um, they were discarded. And it crushed them and uh, traumatized them. And uh, so it's one of the reasons I started the group that I live, learn, and prosper. It's a nonprofit that I started in prison with my wife. And uh, we started it specifically for individuals who had dropped out of gangs to help them cope with the very thing that I'm talking about right now, the post-traumatic stress disorder associated with being an expendable of that gang, of having been violated, having their humanity literally violated. And I still do that work to this day. And um, it's important. 
So part of what I do is to educate. And uh, I do that by coming on shows like yours and talking about these things openly. About, uh, you know, because you, James, you asked a great question. You know, did it feel like the first time I was a part of a family? In my particular case, no. But for the most part, yes, that is the case. Yeah. Um, you know, I, so, I guess I'm yeah. the exception there. So when you're hurting people, Michael, and how much did you use your spirituality as a, I wouldn't say as an excuse, but you, we can use that to try and justify the bad shit that we do, like a caged animal and feeling as if you, what you were doing at that time was worthwhile, like it's kill or be killed mentality. But how much did you use your spirituality as to justify what you were doing? Because like you said earlier, you can't do both. You can't be spiritual, right. but yet hurt another human. But you've still got to defend yourself. And I don't believe that you can, yeah, James. I don't believe that you can, and I don't think that I did. That's where I made reference to the fact that I actually stepped off the red road, you know, and realized that I had, particularly when the elders came to see me and told me that I was serving two fires. So I wasn't using my spirituality uh, to justify my violence or my activities. Um, in fact, I, I had let my spirituality wane um, as a result. Um, and that that was the terrible thing about it uh, is realizing that i had done that you know when when the elders brought me the people's pipe it was it was with a a, a pipe bag a medicine bag a huge bag it's a medicine bundle is what it's called and uh it, it was absolutely gorgeous it was um you know uh three and a half feet long and and um a good 18 inches across and it had eagle feathers and bear medicine and elk medicine and my goodness it was just gorgeous and the strap that was attached to it it was a like a two inch strap was beaded and um in all beadwork there's a story so i had asked one of the elders to tell me the story of the beadwork when they presented me with this medicine bundle and she said um she said, well, you see those arrows there that are going up the strap towards grandfather's eye? And I said, yes. She said, that's your path. That's the good red road. I said, oh. And I saw these wavy lines next to it. And I said, well, what are the wavy lines, Elder? She said, ah. She said, that's life. You see, life takes us off the good red road because we're human beings. And that's what those wavy lines represent. The key is, is to understand that you stepped off the road and stepped back on those straight arrows towards great mystery. And so I never forgot that experience, you know, with that. And so stepping back on the good red road provided me with an opportunity to be a servant again. Um, and I didn't uh, get caught up in those things that I had done by way of justification or rationalization. There is no justification. There is no rationalization. It simply is a matter of survival. And that's what I thought I was engaged in. Um, and I still believe that. Could I have done things differently? Of course I could have. You know, what that would have been? You know, who knows? That's, that's a hindsight characteristic. But in the moment, you know, you have a choice to make, and you make that choice and you go with it, and you live with it as best you can. In my particular case, I was confronted with circumstances that made me reevaluate what I was doing and how I was doing it. And I did that. And then I made another choice, and that was to step away. Um, because it was not in keeping with um, who I believed myself to be. What was the daily routine like? Was it everyday survival mode, Michael? Yes. Especially in the Aryan Brotherhood, was every day a hit out in your life, or was there some days you felt safe? Or was every well, day it, on edge? No, no it's... Uh, survival is such that um, there is no rest from it. None. Um, you know, there are those, many of those, that use drugs, and that was their escape. They would get loaded, or they would get drunk. Um, I never did. You know, my escape um, was education, was books. Um, you know, I wanted to educate myself. And I wanted to learn to read, and I wanted to learn to write, and I did. And once I did that, uh, I put myself through college. 
And um, I started that even while I was a member of the Aryan Brotherhood. But I had an organization to run also. I had to go out and work out every day. Um, back then, I was lifting a lot of iron. And um, I would teach others how to fight. Um, those um, who read would read uh, philosophies like um, Sun Tzu, The Art of War, uh, Nietzsche, Beyond Good and Evil. Um, um, the other side of that is, is Thus Spake uh, Zarathustra, um, uh, Machiavelli, um, Karl von Clausewitz, and then a dialogue would result as a result of that reading by way of what people got out of that. And the idea was, was not to mirror what you were reading, but to make it your own. So, you know, years later, I understood that to be self-efficacy. And um, I did that as a result of my association with a um, brilliant man named uh, um, uh, Albert Bandura, who uh, developed a, the theory of self-efficacy um, uh, through um, a, a social philosophy is really what it is. But at any rate, um, my everyday activities were in, engaged in um, advancing the structure of the Aryan Brotherhood and those who were members and those who were associates. So through uh, relationship, through um, training, um, through education, and through deeds, actually, you know, following through with uh, things that needed to be done, making those decisions, command decisions, um, developing uh, countermeasures to law enforcement's approach to uh, the gangs, uh, counterintelligence, if you will. So I developed that um, and um, developed uh, smuggling weapons into the prison uh, as opposed to cutting knives out of uh, steel that was already in the prison. Um, I learned as a result of uh, physics how to beat metal detectors. And so once I learned how to beat metal detectors, then I had a group of individuals on the street smuggle knives into the prison. So I was using um, buck knives. You know, folding buck knives that when you unfold them are almost nine inches long and uh, very, very sharp. It, um, I smuggled, uh, they didn't have cell phones back then, but I smuggled CB radios in. So I was in contact with uh, all my members that lived in different buildings within the prison uh, through CB radio. I smuggled in guns. Um, so um that's a process. And then, of course, I was engaged in combat with the enemy. At this time, it was the Black Panthers and Black Guerrilla Family and, and, and the Western Familia and the Texas Syndicate. And an ally was the Mexican Mafia and uh, the Hells Angels. And so it was a matter of um, um, interacting with those groups, uh, creating the infrastructure for the Aryan Brotherhood itself, and how that fit with the other groups the development of resources, mastering those resources, the effective utilization of those resources, um, like a business. And uh, so that's that was my daily routine. So obviously when you've got rivals, but then you're making a business, you're smuggling guns, you're smuggling drugs. Was there ever, mm -hmm. could nobody get the heads of all the rival gangs, make a piece while everybody can still make money? Or was it everybody trying to be the head of the prison and try to take control of the drugs and the money? Yeah, that actually did occur. It was um, at Old Folsom, and um, we had paired off with uh, the Black Panthers and Black Gorilla family numerous times. And um, it was actually by agreement because of the way the place was set up. So um, they would go down to the lower end of the yard, and we would amass at the upper end of the yard. And then upon an agreed uh, time, we would merge. and. Um, so one of these times where we were merging as groups to fight, um, I noticed that there were guards up on the second tier looking out the window taking book, betting. on As people paired off with their knives, they were taking book on them. And I stopped everybody. I just yelled. I stopped everybody. Everybody stopped. And I said, look, we're their entertainment. So we need to stop this right now. And let's come together. And we did. We stopped it. We came together. Uh, we called the truce. And we started talking about, um, you know, how we might improve our environment. 
and how we might facilitate that improvement. Uh, in other words, what we needed to do in cooperation with each other as opposed to competing. And cooperation is very, very difficult in prison. It's, it's difficult to get cooperation amongst groups, even within your own group. It can be difficult to get cooperation. But uh, cooperation amongst the guards and so on. And oftentimes that's um, of necessity extremely manipulative. Um, you know, I've been referred to as a master manipulator. And in that context, I am. Um, like everything else in my life, I've turned that around. I've taken all the skills that I acquired as a leader of the Aryan Brotherhood and applied them to legitimate practices because they're the same. You see, the difference here is that you're you're doing legitimate work. You're doing it without infringing upon anybody else's rights. You know, even with a nonprofit, I'm attempting to persuade people to volunteer, to help. But you see, I'm not infringing upon, infringing upon anybody's rights. And that makes the difference. Plus, you get a clean heart with it as well. There's truth in that, James. Well yeah. said. Thank you, brother. So how much drugs were you smuggling in each week? I tell the story about how the FBI, uh, once I stepped away, told me that um, they estimated that um, in Old Folsom alone in 1978 that the Aryan Brotherhood took $3.5 million in drugs out. Um, let me get this thing off the... Um, so that'll give you an idea. I mean, it's very lucrative. Um, the problem was at that time was that uh, the vast majority of the members were drug users, drug addicts. And so the vast majority of any revenues that were being generated as a result of the sale of drugs uh, was going into the arms of the members and their associates. Um, so that's not good business. So the idea was is to stop the drug use and to use those resources towards uh, um, essentially what came down to was organized crime activities. And um, the um, group, the faction of organized crime that I think we most emulated was the Italian Mafia and what they'd done with their organization by way of infrastructure. And so that was the goal. Yeah, the mafia are very well run, but that's yeah. why they've run, run America for many years. Like, it's unbelievable mm -hmm. that the way the five families have operated. Like, the, mm -hmm. When you talk about the skill set and the, it's just masterminding some things, how they've still, I don't know how big they are now. I interviewed Michael Francese not so mm -hmm. long ago, and he was he was pulling in like eight to 10 million pounds a week. Yeah. Like, unbelievable what the mindset can mm -hmm. do and where you can take it. Oh, with. yeah. The right skills that when did this when did the Aryan Brotherhood then become because obviously you get the Nazi signs and the 666 was that in the 70s as well or was that later on? No, the the swastikas didn't occur until later on. You had the shamrock, you know, which I have on my ring finger right there. Mm. Uh, but um. The 666 was an application by some members, and it was to represent um, really the Antichrist uh, in the sense that uh, anti-establishment. So, you know, the story goes that St. Patrick um, taught the trilogy in Ireland uh, using the shamrock. So the 666 was um, a shout out contrarily to that um, anti-establishment. So, um, but the swastika didn't come until years later. Um, you know, many of my battles in, in, in the beginning were with neo-Nazis. Um, I'm not a fan, never have been. Um, don't like anything that they stand for. I'm, I'm quite uh, familiar with Hitler and his organization and I refer to Hitler as the original jawjacker. You know, his use of use of methamphetamine and um, his um, stormtroopers' uh, use of methamphetamine, um, you know, explains a lot of the atrocities that they committed uh, because methamphetamine affects the brain, um, literally. 
Um, it's not just an addiction, but um, I have no no regard whatsoever um, for that group or those which have followed contemporarily. Yeah. So see, at the height of it, in the five years, how many stabbings do you think you've done, Michael? Well, I was involved in 22 knife fights. That I know because I was shot 22 times. You get shot every time? Every time. In one case, I was shot five times in the same fight. Um, but, um, you know, not every knife fight was documented. So I was in other knife fights that weren't documented. Um, but a lot of violence. An extraordinary amount of violence. Um but that's what gives you your reputation and your standing um, within the prison environment. And, um, and of course, I've observed um, numerous knife fights and killings, um, both at the hands of prisoners and guards. What was it like to see your first killing in prison, Michael? You know... <laughs> I think about these things, James, and um, what I realized that I did toward my own survival was that I engaged in what's called stoicism. I stuffed it. You don't allow yourself, I did not allow myself, to be impacted by what I, I was observing. It's brutal. It's gory. Um, it's inhumane. And even though I may have known that at the time, I did not allow myself to think about that. I simply stuffed it. And that stoicism stayed with me for many years. Because it was really, I mean, even, even at, the, at those times when I suffered beatings at the hands of guards, you know, I did not allow myself to engage during or after the fact. Uh, I just simply stuffed it. And, um, you know, it has long-term consequences because, you know, again, in you just asking the question, um, my mind has a reel that it plays of everything that I've seen. It's like, you know, people talk about their life flashing before them. Yeah. Well, that happens. And so you see that. So now as I sit here, uh, I'm required to explain to you my sense of stoicism and how I stuffed it and didn't deal with it at the time. But as I'm sitting here right now, I have to deal with it. And it's gruesome. It hurts. Yeah. You know, there, there's there's nothing else like it. Um, you know, people say, well, you know, he's, he's um, he talks about these things very calmly. Um, which does not explain what's going on inside and um, what you don't allow others to see. And so the value in having this discussion is that it does give me an opportunity to talk about um, the brutality, um, the inhumanity associated with it, the impact that it has upon my sensibilities as a human being. Um, and it's extreme. It makes me question my humanity, you know, and my goal in life right now is to be the best human being I can possibly be. So to, to manifest these images as a result of this discussion or my writings or otherwise uh, requires on my part that I process that. And so I engage in that, you know, I engage in therapy. This is therapy. This is therapy for both oh, of you us. Bet. Yeah, but even bet. though it's dark, I ask a lot of personal and deep questions, but understand it's mm -hmm. to try and get a release and for people to understand that like, you're mm -hmm. not shying away from the questions, Michael, and that's why no. I know you're a, a strong character. But like mm -hmm. you say, you relive that pain every day, no matter how much you can educate yourself or mm -hmm. be spiritual. Mm -hmm. The pain is there until the day we die. Like, I've lost so many family members and friends to murder, suicide, overdose. I've been an addict mm. myself, Michael. I've been in prison. Like, mm. I've done a lot of bad in life. I'm four years clean on that path. Mm. And when you talk about... Congratulations. That's no, huge, man. Yeah, when you talk about the lines and stuff, I understand that. That was just a ripple. But I'm back on that red road, like what you say, or the, the path. Like, 
and I'm trying mm-hmm. to do good and get a deeper understanding of human beings because I believe we're all sensitive. No matter if you're a top boy in the Aryan Brotherhood, like you still feel pain just because you've mm-hmm. been shot over 20 times. Like you talking about right. that and reliving the past will still bring back mm-hmm. all the emotions. Like any other kid standing in mm-hmm. the corner or working in McDonald's, that like, we all feel we're all human, we're yes. all connected, yes. no matter the yes. skin color, no matter the job, no matter the income. Mm-hmm. We're all fucking connected, man. And mm-hmm. and that's the mad thing about life is right now I feel as if a lot of people are disconnected because we all see the world differently, divided, religion, race, mm-hmm. power, money, income, whatever it is. Well, the hatred, brother. The hatred. You yeah. know, that's that's the biggest thing right now. And how do you contend with that? Well, you contend with it through love. You see, and I take that position and and we'll take that position for the rest of my life. Because that's really what you're talking about. The only way that you're going to heal and help others heal is through love. It's, it's real simple. We don't talk about it enough. We talk about a whole lot of hate, but we very rarely talk about the solution to that. You know, why people hate. You know, uh, there's a piece on my website, the haters need to hate. You know, and it goes to the heart of this. But we, what it really comes down to is the capacity with each and every one of us as a human being. You see, to call upon our nature, not the human condition. The human condition is what gets us in the way. But our human nature, and that's the capacity that was given to us. It's an innate capacity for each and every one of us You know, to tap into that, yeah. regardless of what we've been through. You know, there's a saying, my wife tells me it all the time, that once you've heard someone's story, you can't help but love them. The key to that is, is your heart open to that. And that's the real issue here. You see, it, it, you know, my ego strength is intact. I'm not concerned about that. You see, what I am concerned about is my humanity and how I might use the rest of my years on this earth, you see, to facilitate the very thing that you were talking about, to understand that we all hurt, that we all feel pain, that we're all human, regardless of skin color, ethnicity, it doesn't matter. We're all human beings. And that's what's so important here. You see, and for people to be able to talk about their pain is also important. You know, the the, the atrocities that occur behind the Iron Gates from caging human beings are absolutely terrible. And we need more discussion about that, what a person goes through, what they have to do to prepare to come out. I mean... Can you imagine what it's like being 45 years in a cage and then coming out into this? Nah. Most people can't. And I couldn't. See, I thought I was prepared, but I wasn't. I wasn't. You see, that was arrogance on my part. I not only hurt myself, but I hurt my wife. You see, that which is most dear to me. And so the idea behind doing the things that I'm doing and you're doing is to educate people is to ask them to open their heart to the spirit of what we're talking about and just think about it, just consider it. And if you have a story to tell, please tell it. Find a way. Write it. Do a podcast. Do a blog. Come online. Go to a website. I mean, in this day of technology, there are a multitude of ways in which you can do that. The key is to feel safe in doing it, you see, because most people don't feel safe. Those people that have been traumatized, and you'll find that the vast majority of people that have served time behind the Iron Gate have been traumatized. And so that if we can figure out a way to deal with that trauma while they're still incarcerated, while they're doing their time, so that when they are released, they're not repeating that pattern. And that's critical. Absolutely critical. Yeah. So we approach that in a fourfold way. When I say we, I'm talking about live, learn, and prosper. We approach it in a fourfold way. Biopsycho, social, spiritual. Now, spiritual is my foundation for everything. Everything, including my marriage. You see? But I have to take a look at the biological. What's going on with me physiologically? Am I taking care of myself? Am I healthy? You see? Sociologically, am I socially interacting? You see, do I have a life? Psychologically, 
You know, what is my mental state? What is the state of that mental state? And how do I arrive? How do I discern whether I'm healthy or not? I mean, there's just, James, are a number of things that we have available to us as human beings, as families, as communities, as a society, as a global community, if you will. You know, I got a call from a policymaker in the Netherlands um, who works at The Hague. And he wanted my advice on the jihad unit that they're running there. And I was only too happy to be able to weigh in with what I thought. And the issue was, would the elders there influence the youngsters that if they put them in the same unit? Well, my goodness, of course they would. You would think that that would be a foregone conclusion. But there are a number of factors that come into effect there. And so it's looking at those things. It's, it's generating a dialogue, creating a dialogue. You know, that's the very thing you do by this podcast. You generate a dialogue. You ferret out the anxiety, the stress, the story, the love, all of it. And what it allows the viewer to do is to holistically take that in and determine if it has value for them. And perhaps even to emulate something that they see. That's what self-efficacy is. That's self-mastery is to take that in, monitor it, see if it fits you, and then evolve from there. How hard was it for you, Michael, to be in for a double murder that you said you never done, to then people maybe believing you at the start, to then becoming the most violent men in prison, to then being one of the leaders of the Aryan Brotherhood where then nobody would be thinking you ever told the truth about the two murders at the start. Right. How, how hard was that? Well, I, th I think it's a, it's a natural thing that people are going to be suspicious of that, you know, because they want to understand, particularly when I'm asked questions and I don't give the answers that they want. You know, how, can you, how could you look at that? How could you do this? How could you do that and not have an impact upon you? What they're doing is they're... they're relying upon their own experiences. See, and those experiences are limited. That's why it's so important to talk about these things, because you can't imagine what it's like to live behind the Iron Gates, to be in this type of situation. So that when you're faced with a decision like, how could you be engaged in that kind of violence? You know, the simple answer is to say, well, you weren't there. You see, and essentially you have to be there. Yeah. You see, is really what it comes down to. People want to confine what they're hearing within the structure of their own experience. And that experience usually is limited. So what they do is they dismiss it or they say you're lying or you're this or you're that. And that's their prerogative. It's not a judgment on my part. What that requires of me is to find a way to better express myself, to explain myself. You see that, you know, where that empathy is there, where that uh, compassion is there, to bring that out. You know, where that pain and that suffering and that affront to my own humanity as a result of the things that I did comes to the surface is to express that. In other words, what it is, James, is allowing people to see you and most people aren't willing to do that, you see. But it takes courage nobody to let to people see vulnerability. you. Yeah, nobody wants to show no. vulnerability, Michael. Yeah. A lot of people in the world are scared and they're vulnerable. And that's the, the sad thing about it. Like, we don't want people to see through us because mm -hmm. having that vulnerability then, a lot of people see as a weakness when actually it's a strength. Mm. That's like, right. When you're, when you're in prison, Michael, then you're the leader of the Aryan Brotherhood, you've got power, you've got control, you've got money, mm -hmm. you've got people who would kill for you. Mm -hmm. How hard was the decision then to leave it and then put your own life in jeopardy? Well, it wasn't difficult to, to, to leave it. I mean, it was, um, people ask me about that all the time, how difficult was the choice? It wasn't a difficult choice. You know, it, once I knew what I was looking at and I knew that that was contrary to who I was as a human being and the way that I was raised, it was a very easy choice. What followed, um, I never could have anticipated. 
by way of more violence and corruption and um, um, <laughs> just an entirely different, you know, by way of example, the scenarios are so extreme by way of being opposite, um, but similar nonetheless, that my time with the Aryan Brotherhood is the first 10 chapters of my book. By growing up, time in the Aryan Brotherhood, and that, that's 10 chapters. That's part one. Part two is once I stepped away, working with law enforcement, testifying in court, threats on my life, you know, snipers on the roof, bombs on the transportation car. I mean, it's just uh, corrupt administration. Um, that's an entirely different scenario. Uh, so, you know, I'm really at odds here right now. I may just go ahead and publish the first 10 chapters and let that be out there because that says one thing. And then continue working on the second 10 chapters and put that out there because it says something entirely different. We'll see. What was the reason for leaving Michael? Well, it's those two truths. You know, there was individuals that were going to be executed and had and were executed, as a matter of fact. Um, of course, there was a visit by the elders. That was huge. So far as telling me you can't serve two fires. And um, then there was the idea of... Um, there was a case up in Oregon, and it was a Hell's Angel case. And it wasn't something that was condoned by Sonny Barger, I want to make that clear, uh, because he was the leader of the, the Hell's Angels. He just recently passed over. Again, I'll say it, rest in peace. You know, uh, Sonny was a friend. And, um, but um, Margot Compton and her two six-year-old twin daughters and her boyfriend were executed by two shooters. Now, Margo was a witness against Buck Garrett, who was the um, second in command of the Hells Angels at the time. She testified for the feds against him for pimping and pandering. He got four years. But when he found out where she was at, and he did, um, he sent two shooters up there. They went into the side door. They shot Gary, who was on the couch. They went into the bedroom. They took Margo's two six-year-old twin daughters, they laid them on the bed, wrapped their arms around their teddy bears, they held Margo, and then they shot the little girls in the head while they made her watch, and then they shot her in the head. I cannot ever, under any circumstances, see myself condoning that, being a part of that, being associated with anybody who would be a part of that. So that was one of the factors. And I went up and I testified against the Hells Angels in that case. And the courtroom was filled with Hell's Angels. There was threats on my life and everything else. And I would do it again. Without hesitation. There was a situation where an individual was testifying against members of the Aryan Brotherhood. And so the subject was broached in so far as to kill this individual's wife and daughter. And then his parents. And it took everything I had in me to move them away from the wife and daughter and the mother. And it left the father. And I still bear the responsibility for that father having been assassinated. Because I didn't stop it. I stepped away from the brand, but I didn't stop it. You see, I had an opportunity to stop two guards from being killed in the federal prison by AB members. And so I went to law enforcement with that and told them that guards are going to be killed. And they laughed at me because the Aryan Brotherhood had never taken a violent position against guards before. But now that it's shifted, it had changed. Just like perpetrating violence against innocent people had changed. And so with these changes staring me directly in the face, I had another choice to make. Was I going to be a part of this? And I was not, could not, would not. And so I made the decision to step away. But with that came a responsibility. I had helped build this group. This group that was now going to perpetrate violence against innocent people. So I had a responsibility to bring that group down. So I've done training films for law enforcement. 
I went on a lecture circuit, speaking strictly to law enforcement, to put them up on that game. You see, it, um, and it continues to this day. You know, I'll still work with law enforcement toward their understanding of what they're dealing with. Whether it's drive-by shootings, people that shoot into a house where children are killed, are you serious? That's a warrior? I don't think so. How hard is that to live with that pain, Michael? That obviously you can see you're getting quite emotional with. Well, you, know, you can't live get with killed. it. Like, how do yeah, you... Yeah. Uh, it's, 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 you know, you cope. You cope. You deal with it. You know, yeah. You know, the old Provo faction over there in Ireland, there was a time when I supported that by way of running guns and otherwise. But when they hooked up with the PLO and they started bombing civilians, then I removed myself from it. You see, man to man, I don't have a problem with that. If as men we're going out on a battlefield and we're going to do battle because we believe in some principle, whatever it may be, even if that's just controlling your resources, to this day I don't have a problem with that. What I do have a problem with is when you victimize innocent people and people call that collateral damage, I don't think so. It doesn't work like that. These are people who have no idea what the game is. If you're in the game, then you know what the rules are. So that if it comes to violence, you know why. But if you can't get to an individual for whatever reason, and you turn around and you blow up his house and destroy his family or kill his children, or his wife, that's not a warrior. That's not a human being. Now, I know it happens all over the world. But in this context, I'm talking about gangs. And there needs to be a lot more discussion about it. You know, I hear too much talk about, oh, you know, he's a snitch, he's a rat. That's, what, that's the language the gangs develop so that it won't come back on them. They want to shame you so that you won't give up their game. I mean, my goodness, you can go back years where, you know, maybe your parents told you, don't be a tattletale. Well, I understand that in that context, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about victims. We're talking about innocent people. And that's important, very, very important. And there needs to be a dialogue about it. What is it uh, they say? Uh, see something, say something. You see, in this day and age, that becomes critical. If you see something and it doesn't look right, say something. How hard was that, Michael, then to then sit at court, give testimonies like, what what was your life like then? Like, were you just in solitary confinement every day or was there still hits out in your life? Like, How have you managed to survive? There have been numerous attempts on my life. The last uh, assassination attempt was in 2015. Just before now you were I, released? Yeah, it's about four years before I was released. Um, but I'd taken a, a vow of nonviolence many years before. And so, unfortunately, I was, I was, um, I was a clerk at the time, captain's clerk. And um, I was helping people with their work. And one guy was going to the board the next morning. So, I just finished a double shift and he asked if I would help him with his paperwork. And I said, yeah, I would. So we sat down on a bench out in the day room and I let this guy get behind me. He was um, a Mexican mafia um, hitman. And I let him get behind me and um, I was tired. So I was not paying attention. And he did a roundhouse kick and took me over the, the back of the head over heels backwards. I went semi unconscious and um he straddled me and grabbed me by the hair and he reached in, he had a box cutter and he was gonna cut my throat. I couldn't see, but I could hear. So I heard his hand come by me and um, as he reached in to cut my throat, I blocked it and he cut my ear in half. And a, a doctor fortunately developed a new technique and was able to sew my ear back on, uh, which was nice. I like my ears, <laughs> um, but... Um, he reached in again. He choked up on my hair. I still couldn't see. 
and he reached in again, and he went deeper. I guess he was going for the windpipe, too. And um, But like I said, I could hear his movements, and I could feel his body language through his hand on my hair. And so I blocked it again. This time he caught the back of my throat, and he missed my anterior artery by um, one millimeter. And um, so then he choked up again. Uh, this is being observed by staff. I mean, I, I just, I recently read the write-up on the air so people would understand that staff were observing this. And um, this third time when he choked up and he reached in, I got my sight back. So I saw the weapon and I took the weapon away from him. And in truth, there was an opportunity to break his neck. And it, I ran that through my head. But I heard my wife's voice, and my native name is Sky, Old Man Sky. And she said, Sky, no. And I heard that. And so I just took the weapon and I put it up underneath me and I laid down on top of it and I waited for staff to arrive. Now, I was working with 600 other prisoners at the time in 15 different groups through my, my, my Live, Learn, and Prosper organization in the prison, that prison. And I'd been essentially preaching to them nonviolence. A lot of these were old dropout gang members. And I was telling them, you don't need to resort to violence. You know, communication, there's a number of ways, depending on the situation. In this situation, once I took the weapon away, there was no need for violence, even though I could have used it against them. So because I took the actions that I did, this resonated through that entire community. It had an enormous positive impact. And I'm deeply grateful for that. The fact that I didn't resort to violence when I could have said something to them, that what I was attempting to explain to them was honest. Yeah, because if you do then, Michael, then everything you say then is full of shit, basically, because then people, yeah. it just doesn't yeah. mean anything. You have no credibility. You're just talking yeah. out the side of your neck. You're another yeah. jaw, jaw jacker. You yeah. see? And uh, so... You know, that uh, was a pivotal point. It was a milestone in my life. Um, realizing that uh, I could actually practice that. And that uh, I had the wherewithal to know that the threat was over. So it had an enormous impact on the community, and uh, I'm grateful for that. Yeah, that was the last attempt. And that's just one example of a number of attempts over the years when I stepped away. You know, some of them while I was under um, escort by uh, what they what they referred to as um, my handlers. You know, when I was going out to court and testifying. Um, so you know that included uh, bombs on the transportation car. It included snipers. In one case, I was held in a substation, and the guy had uh, keistered a twenty-five automatic weapon. Uh, they found out where I was at, and he got picked up for drunk driving in the area, and they brought him into that substation. Well, his mission was to shoot me with this little twenty-five auto that he had keistered, and um, in his rectum. And. Uh, one of the officers that was part of my security team just didn't feel right. So he took a picture of this guy and brought it into me, and I recognized him. So they x-rayed him and found the 25 automatic. So it's just little things like that, you know, that uh, you, you have to go through. I was, I was subjected to beatings by the guards that um, it was called the Green Wall. And uh, they were sharks. That's, that was their name for themselves. And they, they thought that uh, I was going to testify against other guards in a killing where they shot a man in the head and they murdered him. But they thought I was going to testify in that case. Um, I didn't have to. Um, I would have, I would have had they asked me, but at any rate, because they thought um, they, uh, I was going out to court in Oregon at the time testifying against the Hells Angels. So they called me out of my cell and they chained me up. I had a lot of chains on me and cuffs and, so I thought I was going out to court. Well, I, in fact, I wasn't going out to court. They took me into a room and um, beat me to the point where the, for the first time in my life, I thought I was going to die. And the only thing that saved me was that um, I was choking on my own blood and I was able to bring it up and spit it at him. And when I spit it at him, I told him, that's all you got. 
And um, it was bravado, of course, on my part, uh, because I was just about done. And uh, for whatever reason, that stopped him. But that was just one of a number of beatings that uh, was administered to me by guards because I was testifying in cases in which they were involved. So, you know, it was investigated by the Department of Justice, the FBI. There was a hearing before the Senate Select Committee legislature in, in California. Um, like I said, that's that's the second half of the book because it, it's a different story. Yeah. How many it, convictions it, did you get, Michael? In the cases I've testified in? Yeah. Yeah, there have been convictions in every case except one. And like I said, I, I don't go into those with the idea that I'm a prosecution witness or that I'm seeking conviction. I simply go in and tell what I know, the truth. And what the jury does with that is their business. If they believe it or don't believe it, you know, it is not my business. I simply, you know, say what I know and let them decide for themselves. So in every case but one, um, there were convictions. And um, I think in the one case, it was just a matter of um, one convict testifying against another convict. And, you know, I, I, like I said, I don't get into the analysis. Um, and um, it's not my place. See, well, the stabbings you've done in the violence, like, did you never get mm -hmm. any, any more time added on, Michael? Or was when you turned evidence that you get time reduced? Like, how did it work? No. Yeah, I picked up um, other sentences uh, as a result of stabbings. Three that I can think of right now down in Chino. I got uh, um, seven years on each one of those. But um, no, I never received any favors or anything else. When I stepped away from the brand, I did an additional 35 years. Um, I never allowed any of my cooperation with law enforcement to be discussed before the board or otherwise. I didn't do it for that reason. I did it because I believed it was the right thing to do. And, um, you know, some people take issue with that. They can. I don't mind. Take issue with it. But, you know, everything that I'm talking about and everything I've ever done is well documented. It's all a matter of public record. So, you know, if I had received some kind of favor, it would be public record, believe me. And there'd be people screaming about it. But uh, no, I didn't do it for that reason. I don't continue to cooperate with law enforcement insofar as educating them um, for anything. And um, you know, all my work with uh, addicts and otherwise is pro bono. I don't charge. Um, this is about helping people. This is about educating people. And if we can... If we can do that um, as a community, that's great. If we can do that as an individual, as we come together, however we do it. But it needs to be done. It needs to be talked about. Look at your own experiences. Look what you're doing as a result of that. That has extraordinary value. If you're anything like me, you wake up every morning grateful. Yeah. Because I, I do. Every morning. Yeah, you've got to, man. Life's a beautiful thing. It's a, it's a journey, like you say, Michael, but it is a scary mm -hmm. journey because sometimes you question, I still question things that I'm doing and sometimes I think about the mm -hmm. past where it can bring you down a bit, but it doesn't stop me. I'm still, mm -hmm. I've got so many levels to go on this life to try and not just help yeah. myself, but help others around me by learning from right. my mistakes. I don't shy away, but mm -hmm. I'm still learning because I, I still fuck up daily. I still make mistakes, but I don't. Ah, oh, you're human. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so when you when you leave then, Michael, obviously, you're you 35 years again after it. Like, what was the worst day you ever had in prison? Well, you know, bar none, it, it always comes back to being in that cage. You know, I, like I said, I didn't receive any special treatment or get special housing or anything. I was still in a cage. And um, a lot of that cage time was in solitary confinement. Um, supposedly for my own safety. Um, but eventually I was able to, to uh, convince them to let me back out on the main line, and I went back out on the main line. And, um, you know, I continued my education. I got my first doctorate in 1988. I got my second doctorate in 2000. And then I became a drug and alcohol counselor while I was still incarcerated. And I uh, went through their program and became certified and then started working for the Department of Corrections as a 
alcohol and drug counselor. And I did that right up until the time I, I paroled. Um, plus, I started Live, Learn, and Prosper in 2014. And, you know, that went on for five years and it's still going on. There are a lot of people that, uh, you know, are trying to shut me up and close it down. Um, you know, mostly gangs, corrupt law enforcement, um, you know, the other side of what I'm trying to do um, insofar as helping people. And so, you know, that's the battle that we have really is, uh, you know, having to contend with that. But, you know, I don't get caught up. People say, well, do you read the reviews? No, I don't. I don't. You know, well, you know, you got a lot of people hating on you. And I said, well, you know, that's their problem. You know, uh, I'm, I'm sad for them. And like I said, haters need to hate. And, um, that's a reality, unfortunately. Yeah. But, you know, one of the things I'm concerned about right now is domestic terrorism. Um, I think it's huge. Um, I think it's it's going somewhere, and I don't like what's, where it's going. You know, these these kids that are being recruited into these organizations, they're expendable. And just like the jihadists, they're being sent into these areas and executing all these people. And for what? For what? Because somebody else is hating? You know, these kids don't know what they're doing. They're being manipulated. The vast majority of them come from broken families. They're looking for family, like you pointed out a little earlier about prisons, prison gangs. The same thing now is happening on the streets. They're recruiting these kids. And they're using them to hurt other people, to facilitate their hate. Interestingly enough, they call them hate groups because of the type of crimes that they're committing. And they're atrocious crimes. And we need to generate a dialogue about that. What's happening with these kids? What might we do to turn them away from that? You see, I'm not against these groups. I'm for these kids and bringing them away from that, preventing them from even becoming involved in that. And how do you do that, James? Speaking out. You do it with love, man. You do it with love. Mm -hmm. That's all these kids want. That's why they, they join these, these organizations. They want to be loved. It's really that simple. You don't need to put a lot of ha-ha on it. They just want to be a part of something. They want to be loved. They want to be needed. Yeah. And as a global community, that's our responsibility. It's tribalism. People just want to feel part of some sh sort of shit, no matter mm. if it's good or bad in life. What was John Le Gotti like, Michael? I watched something about the Aryan Brotherhood where he needed protection or... Yeah, he was given protection by... Yeah, yeah he, he was given protection. I mean, the whole idea there is like anything else, resources, whether we were using Charlie Manson's resources or John uh, Gotti's resources. Um, there's an opportunity there with Gotti and um, the mob, it was about, um, you know, picking up contracts, you know, a lot of money. Um, the mob knows what it's doing. They're money makers. And um, so it was about picking up contracts and then providing protection to those individuals that were behind the iron gates, like Gotti. And um, it doesn't matter who you are on the street, in the joint, you're going to conform to the convict code, the structure. In other words, if the gang's running a joint, you're going to do what the gang says, no matter who you are on the street. What was Charles Manson like? Well, you know, I just did a piece here recently on Charlie. And uh, last thing I want to do is perpetuate the myth of Charlie Manson. But, you know, I referred to him in the past as a punk. He was a punk and a pedophile. And uh, he was a two-bit crook that uh, had the ability to con and manipulate younger girls and some guys. And he did that effectively. He used lysergic acid, LSD, uh, to do that. Uh, he used uh, the times, essentially, um, you know, 60s, what was going on in this country by way of, uh, you know, the hippies and, and uh, the dropout scene and uh, against the Vietnam War and everything else. He used all that to his advantage. But he was an opportunist um, and um, was not very intelligent. Uh, I don't know why people ascribe intelligence to him. He had uh, choreographed routines that he used and practiced uh, for his interviews. 
You know, it was like he just took him off the shelf. He, he couldn't have a conversation, but he could choreograph these routines like a song. He was a songwriter. So he would choreograph these routines like, like a song. And then when the time came, he would run through that routine. And that's all he had to say other than making stupid faces. But, um, you know, I, <laughs> I tried to help him. I did ceremony with him. You know, I, I tried to set up an organization for him that was environmentally sound, you see. But none of us should ever be stopped from attempting to try to help somebody regardless of the circumstances. The choice as to whether or not they come to that of their own volition is their choice. There's nothing we can do about that. That's true even in addiction. I can talk until I'm blue in the face in trying to help somebody with addiction, but until they come to that of their own volition and realize that they have an addiction, nothing's going to happen. And that's the problem with addiction. It's a disease of the brain. It's not moral turpitude. We used to think that. You know, we used to think that the brain wasn't plastic, but we now know that the brain is plastic and that we have the ability as human beings physiologically to manifest new dendrites in the brain, to create a new memory. It takes, a, it takes us away from that fragmented memory of trauma. Epigenetics, it, you know, it's up and coming. It's going to be a huge field, and it needs to be a huge field toward our understanding of how the impact of the environment, the, the environment's impact upon our cellular regeneration at an epigenetic level. And it's huge. I think that shows you your character, though, Michael. Even though the crimes that some people have done, you're still willing to help them. But how did you manage to see the world that way? Especially the life that you led for a while. You had the pure life, the clean life, to then prison, to then changing again and getting back on that road. Like how could how did you see people as human and not the the the, the scary things that they've done? The greatest influence in my life is my wife. And what she did was she loved me unconditionally. But she's a taskmaster. I call her Dragon Lady. Because she takes me to issue. She does not let me get away with anything. It's like you said, on your day-to-day -day basis, you're a human being. So you're constantly getting caught up in this and caught up in that. And I do the same thing. Because I'm still not prepared to be out here. I'm still working on that. So much of this is new to me and overwhelms me. But this woman, Ariel Tomioka is her name, has loved me unconditionally and has guided me and directed me toward my understanding of myself. You see, what happens, James, when you be, are arrested at the age of 22 is that your emotional development is arrested. There is no more emotional development because everything is about survival, like the Stoicism I talked about. So you don't have the regular experiences that people have as they're growing older to learn how to discern and make decisions and to trust and so on. I had none of that. I went into a prison environment where it's one way and only one way. So my emotional intelligence was arrested. And so since I've been out in this very short time, I'm developing my emotional intelligence. And I'm doing that with the help of my wife, who is brilliant. You know, she's a mitigation specialist. She works with death row prisoners and their families. She's been doing this for 20 years. But I also have a friend, Kevin, who is a, a therapist, but he's also a damn good friend, my best friend, you see. And he keeps it real with me. He talks to me. You see, we talk about PTSD. As a matter of fact, we're going to do a podcast together because we think the conversation that we're going to have might help somebody. And that's what this is about. So my intent here is to get my wife to continue writing. She's a brilliant writer. And she won't come on camera with me, but she will do a podcast with me. So I want to get her to start talking. Uh -huh. You know, because just the same way that she's helped me, I know that she can help others. How did you meet well, like I said, she's a mitigation specialist that works with people who are facing the death penalty. So she had a client who was Aryan Brotherhood. 
And it was a RICO prosecution of a number of Aryan Brotherhood members, and it was a death penalty case. So she was hired to mitigate his circumstances relative to convincing the jury not to put him to death. So he sent her to see me to get me to recant everything I'd ever said about the Aryan Brotherhood. They were portraying the Aryan Brotherhood as just a social club, which is absurd, really, if you think about it. But that's what they were trying to tell members of a jury, that they were a social club. Now, if the jury doesn't know, I imagine they could think, well, you know, maybe they are just a social club. Maybe they just sit around playing dominoes. But at any rate, she was sent to see me. So she came up to see me and uh, we met and started talking. We spent about 15 minutes dealing with the issue that I was not going to change my testimony or the intelligence that I had provided. So we set that aside and we just had a conversation as two human beings. And so for 10 years, we were just friends. And uh, she'd come to visit me every weekend. And uh, even when I was out in Susanville, she'd, she'd drive 10 miles one way, spend the weekend, visit me, and drive 10 miles, I mean 10 hours, and drive 10 hours back. No matter where I was at, she came to visit me. So after 10 years, we realized that uh, there was something more to our relationship than just a platonic friendship. So we got married. And, Congratulations. Um, thank you. And um, so we've been together coming up on 18 years. And, um, you know, she was with me in prison through a lot of that madness. She stood by me. She fought for me. When uh, the administrators were trying to kill me and set me up, she stepped right into it and pointed them out. And we pulled her covers, really, is what she did. And um, so, you know, she became public enemy number two. I remained public enemy number one, but she became public enemy number two. And, um, you know, we don't live together. We're not together. Can't be. Why? The threat. You see? So How old is that, Michael? It's difficult. I, I use every opportunity I can to uh, go be with her, and they allow me to do that. I'm still on parole, and I'm on probation. You see? So um, I have to ask permission to get a travel pass, and then I get travel down, and we spend time together, and then I come back here. So we're, we're 500 miles apart. What was your first day release like, Michael, after 45 years inside the cage? It was actually pretty simple. I mean, they it, <laughs> they put me in a cage... And let me dress, give me my dress outs. And I dressed out and they put me in a van and they drove me over to a parking lot, train station. And they let me out of the van and said, see ya. I said, okay. Um, and out from behind the car walked my wife. Ah, you see, I've always been free in my mind, but now I'd been liberated. And I embraced my wife, of course. And then um, we went and had sushi. <laughs> so, you know, I had a friend come by and he says, um, I'm water clan. So he says, I know you want to go to the beach and pay your respects to the mother. And I said, I do. He said, well, let me take you. Because I had to go into a six-month program immediately for transitional housing. So... I checked in with my parole officer and then I had to check into this transitional housing and then I had to get permission for him to take me down to the beach. So we drove down to the beach and um, we couldn't get to the water. There were so many people. We could not get to the water. So we had to walk out in the pier. And, you know, I wanted to touch the water, but I got to look at the ocean. I got to look at the mother. And I turned around on the pier and I looked back towards the shore. My goodness, it looked like an ant colony. Just nothing but houses and people and I said, okay, I've seen enough. Let's go. And um, so I went through that six-month program and, um, you know, tried to see my wife as much as possible as I could while I was in that program. I had to work while I was in the program. And um, you have to go through all their classes and everything also. And uh, even though I taught those classes, I still had to go through them. 
Um, but that's that was my immediate release. The first week I was out, three men were shot in the head just around the corner from where I was staying. Gangers, gangbangers, just drove right up and shot him in the head. And it wasn't that much later that um, a man was stabbed to death out in front of the house. So the violence was really no different than than prison. So what's your life like now, Michael? Is is there still a hit out in your life? Is there still a price over it? Or are you... Yeah, yeah. There's there's still there's still all that. I don't dwell on it. I live my life. You know, I um this morning before we did this, uh, I'm splitting up twenty rounds of wood or uh, twenty cords of, of wood. And uh, I cut and stacked four cords this morning. Um before we did this. Um you know, I work out every day. I've got an 18 and a half foot canoe that I go out on the lake on. Um, I engage uh, with a dojo um, and a sensei in Aikido twice a week uh, and enjoy that. Um, so it's just, you know, I, um, I do a lot of uh, manual labor. Uh, I'm denied access to the internet right now. So I can't even go on my website uh, to talk to people on my website. You know, I'm doing this today because I have a uh, studio engineer like you do that uh, has set this up. You know, he can have access to the Internet, but I can't. So the court allows me to do this, but I can't access the Internet otherwise. I can make calls and, make, and, and text, but I can't have any data. I can't go on the Internet. And uh, it makes life very difficult. So we're actually going into court on that because it's the Supreme Court in this country ruled that it's um, unconstitutional. So unfortunately, I I have to fight for it. You know, people may be uh, of the opinion that based on my cooperation with law enforcement that everything is just laid out for me. It's not. I'm still public enemy number one to a lot of law enforcement. They see me as a trophy. And if they can put me back in prison, they will. And that's what they're trying to do right now. You seem so, very, yeah. You seem very in tune with the universe, Michael. You seem like very calm. You've got a great order about you, even though the shit that you've been involved in and the shit that you've done. Like, I still see a good mm-hmm. person and a good Thank energy. You. Like, what's your plans? I feel as if you maybe see the future, but what are your plans for the future? Well, my to be a servant. You know, simply put, um, it's my life purpose. It's my wife's life life purpose, and we're going to do that together. We're going to continue working with Live, Learn, and Prosper. We're going to continue working with people. We're going to continue writing. I'm going to continue lecturing on the lecture tour. Um, I've been asked to do a TED Talk, so I'll probably do that. Um, And I'm going to start my own podcast. Um, And I'm going to continue going on podcasts like yours. Um, Just to interact with people such as yourself that have the experience, that know what I'm talking about, that can weigh in with their own experiences, and that uh, are there to to help, to enlighten, to educate. And, um, you know, I'm, I admire you and I'm grateful for you and what you're doing. Likewise, brother. Just before we finish up, you don't seem a man who gets very emotional, but can I ask you a question? It's quite personal, but when was the last time you cried, Michael? Oh, yesterday. Yeah. 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 It's, It's almost a daily occurrence. I was, uh, talking to Kevin and then, you know, when I talk to my wife and, you know, my wife makes me watch movies now and I never watch TV. So now I watch TV and I watch movies and um, and I cry watching the movies and uh, the TV and she she doesn't. And I said, what's the matter with you? How can you not cry at this? And uh, she says, "I, you're just an old broad. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I said, OK, I'll take that. Mm-hmm. Um, because I, I enjoy being human and, um, but, um, yeah, I'm deeply touched by a lot that's happening, um, in our world. And, um, you know, when I hear these things happening, uh, they do bring tears to me. And how, how can they not? Uh, because I allow myself now to, to feel, you know, I no longer have to engage in that stoicism that I did in prison. And, um, you know, I, I regulate my emotions, uh, but not to the point of stoicism. And um, I enjoy being human. 
It's a great, great feeling. Why do you think you're still alive, Michael? Well, because I think it has to do with my purpose. Uh, my purpose as a servant. Um, to help others. You know, as many times as I've been shot, many things that have happened to me over the years, and that I'm still here, you know, that I was released from prison when I was never supposed to be released. No one thought I was ever going to get out because I wouldn't admit the crime. But that happened. You see, now I'm in court, maybe looking toward exoneration. Wow. You see, is time relative? Nah, who knows? You know, I'm in my 70s. I got another 30 years ahead of me. I'll make it to 100 easy. I think so. Yeah. So, you know, just think about it. I got 30 good years to do some good work, to enjoy life, to love and be loved, to nurture and be nurtured. It's amazing. I love my life. I do. Yeah, that's a beautiful thing, though, especially everything that you've been through in life. But you can't change lives unless you... If you're feeling fucking unhappy, that like you've got to enjoy yeah. it to mm -hmm. then help others. Like you're mm -hmm. light then guides others out of the darkness. A lot of people might not agree with what you've done, but a lot of people will agree with what you're doing now, which is a mm. beautiful thing. And like you talk about the road and getting back on the road, everybody's on it and off it. But it's called life, yeah. like you say. That like I'm mm -hmm. a big believer in spirit guides, and I believe you're very well connected and, and protected also. That like look you. at the, the hits that you've had out in your life and you're still here to tell the mm. tale you're clearly here for a reason you have a purpose mm. you'll be changing life daily and no doubt the lives that you're changing now helps with the pain of the past as well because no matter how much we can educate on myself on the brain and, and energies and whatever it is like the mm -hmm. pain's still there the brain's a powerful thing it absorbs everything but it it's trying to live in the present moment to then create your better future which is difficult because there's so many there's so many distractions now with internet, TV, and, and probably that could be a good thing in your life right now that you've not got internet because you can really get connected with it where it disconnects you from life, Michael, mm. because um, there's so many distractions. Like being in nature mm -hmm. is where I feel alive. Being in mm -hmm. the mountains or in hull walks, or I do a lot of cold water therapy here where I'm in the cold mm -hmm. water because it numbs. The screams up here don't seem as loud when I'm in nature. Mm. The voices are still there, the pain's still there, but I still push through them with doing the natural things in life. And mm -hmm. it can be difficult because I'm trying to create one of the biggest podcasts in the world. I'm trying to create the biggest conversations that people have ever seen. And with that comes enormous amount of pressure. Mm. But again, I just know it's the right purpose because I won't falter. I, I, sometimes I hit speed bumps, but I don't break. I've never broke. I've never bent over mm -hmm. or laid down for anyone in life, Mike, when I fucking never will. Like, I, mm. I have morals. Maybe back in the day I didn't, but I was lost, I was confused, uh, I took much drink and drugs to try and heal, numb the pain, mm -hmm. not realising mm -hmm. it made the pain worse, but I'm on a great path now, I'm learning, mm -hmm. I'm open to just learning from more mistakes and try to love again and try to, the, the, the main thing is as well is try to accept love, Michael, because it's scary, when you become mm -hmm. vulnerable and become mm -hmm. to someone to accept the love, you, you feel that you can get hurt which is a fucking scary thing because nobody wants to feel pain and a, a woman's pain is is harder than anything. All the shit you've been oh, through, yes. that yeah. you've been away from your, your wife, uh, it, it's probably the hardest thing you, you'd have ever have to deal mm -hmm. with, even though you've it dealt is. with so much shit. Mm -hmm. It is, you're right. You know, but what you're doing, it, it takes enormous courage. It really does. And, and, and I'll say it again, I so admire you for that. And the thing here is, is that I don't know what the future holds for you. I can see the path that you're on, and it's a good path. So I'd like you to bear one thing in mind as you continue down that path. You keep me in mind. And if you come across anything that you think that I can assist you with or help you with, or we can just have a conversation about, or if you just want to have a phone call. You hear what I'm, you hear what I'm saying? Yeah, I appreciate that, brother. Yeah. I mean, that's what it's about. It's about relationship. And likewise, though. Oh, uh, yeah. Thank you. I, I will do that. I will just do that. Just before we finish up, like, where can people get a hold of your stuff, your website, books, whatever? Yeah, we'll have the book coming out here in the next couple of months. Um, Synchrony Press will release it. Uh, Ron Turner is the um, owner and operator of Synchrony Press, and, and, and he'll be coming out with it. There may be other things happening also. There's some things in the works I don't know about. Um, completely about uh, the, the, in the hands of other people is what I'm saying. So 
Uh, when that comes out, uh, I'll let you know that the book's out, and maybe you can let your viewers know. Yep. Um, but other than that, the website is livelearnandprosper.org. And uh, I'm going to be putting up my own podcast. So at some point, I'll send you the link for that. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd like to do this again. Definitely. I, f I feel as if a friendship will be getting started from today. Yeah, Moving forward, too. Michael, um, I got in contact with the Damage Done podcast for, mm -hmm. I seen you on there and I was blown away mm -hmm. by your story. That It's unbelievable mm -hmm. what you're trying to do in life. It takes enormous amount of courage, especially having a hit out in your life. But again, with your visualization and your belief in that ego mm -hmm. behind you as well, I believe you're connected to something, whether it's flying solo or seeing your prey from a distance, I believe you're very in mm -hmm. tune with the universe. A lot of people might not understand this stuff, but you know mm. what I'm talking about. Um, yes, I do. But for coming on today and telling your story, mate, it's been unbelievable. For anybody that's watching, Michael, that's maybe struggling, what advice would you have for them? I guess the same advice my elder gave me, you know, that everything has a voice, no matter what it is. And that if you'll just simply open your heart to the spirit of that voice, it will speak to you. You know, and in your, in your, your darkest moments, you see, the light in that is love. Love yourself, first and foremost. You see, that enables us to love others, and that's what relationship is about, is the, the ability and the capacity to love. You know, it's the greatest gift we were ever given as human beings, is just that. You know, it's at the, it's the, it's at the root of life. And, um, you know, if somebody needs help, you know, I don't have access, like I said, to the Internet. But if um, if they think I can help them, um, get, on, get on my website and leave a message. And my, my great niece manages it for me. She'll get the message to me. And I, I won't be able to, you know, go on the Internet or anything like that. But I can call them, and I will. I'll call them. You know, I'll engage on any level. doesn't matter. Um, because that's what it's about. Yeah, that's amazing, brother. Again, Michael, for coming on today and telling your story, it's been amazing. A lot of people get a lot of positives from this. You're a man that doesn't shy away from his past, and for being in prison mm -hmm. for 45 years for something you never done, I'm glad you're getting some light shed on that and eventually mm -hmm. getting Thank the you. right verdict. Um, but mm -hmm. again, amazing story. I look forward to speaking to you and having many more conversations with you. I can anything I can ever help with. I'm only a phone call away, brother. But again, thank you. thank you. God bless you and keep doing the right thing in life. And you, brother. Take thank care. Thank you, brother. Take care.